Today I'll be talking about um, what you could consider an alternative management strategy for manure impacted environments. Um, some of these slides are from the work that um, I'm conducting with others. Uh, some of the slides toward the later part of this talk um, is largely the work from Gary Brewer, um, Zhang Wei Zhu, and David Boxler on some of the stable fly stuff that we'll be talking about. So uh, to start at the beginning, uh, biodiversity was given definition in 1986, and this really encompasses a key characteristic of life on Earth, uh, which is hereditarily based variation. And at the species level, um, this is comprised of numerous life forms uh, with various abundances, uh, and most of these are arthropods. So um, at least in pest management, there's been a strong in, uh, emphasis in some cases uh, has caused us to overlook the ways in which we might uh, really plan for and recruit some of the biodiversity um, in our surrounding environments. And so, um, so I'm interested in this interaction and how we might uh, best plan for some of this biodiversity in our agroecosystem management. Of course, not all agroecosystems are alike. They differ in age and structure and management. And at least in cropping systems, there's been a concept that's been around since the 1970s um, that has defined ecosystem diversities uh, in crops. And Southwood and Way uh, defined these four characteristics of ecosystem diversity in crops. Uh, that is, uh, to be diverse, they have to have diverse diversity of vegetation of the entire landscape, uh, some permanence of the crop, low management intensity, and low isolation of that cropping system from natural vegetation. And so for the purposes of this talk and some of my interests, um, I think that one, um, one landscape, one agroecosystem that fits uh, all four of these characteristics would be rangeland systems. And in our rangeland uh, systems, we have a common management challenge uh, particularly in western uh, region, which is uh, rangeland grasshopper management. And within um, pest management in general, we have these two general categories uh, or strategies of pest management that we could pursue. There's preventative management or curative management. And as you look down, a lot of these pre preventative procedures, and this is specifically for rangeland grasshopper management, these are low cost, uh, low input options that uh, as I mentioned earlier, really set up the landscape for the best case scenario in terms of pest management. Whereas on the right hand side, the curative approaches, uh, which are necessary in some situations, the intervention and suppression options, uh, is really a nod to the fact that sometimes outbreaks still happen. Uh, grasshopper outbreaks are a common feature of rangeland. And so uh, in, in the case of curative approaches, they're a little more costly, um, perhaps more scouting, um, fees are necessary, uh, as well, uh, and of course, uh, chemical input costs as well. But even in this management uh, procedure for grasshopper management, uh, which I won't get into today, uh, there are uh, procedures in place to make uh, the best case scenario of um, grasshopper management and input costs, uh, keeping them low. So for this talk, what I want to do is connect two general ideas. Uh, first, starting off talking about the conservation of dung beetles through grazing management, so more of a preventative approach uh, from pest management and ecosystem services in general. And then using biopesticides with minimal effects, presumably, on dung beetles. Now, why dung beetles? Well, mostly uh, there's been some workers that have shown that um, dung beetles provide uh, about $380 million in services annually. Uh, to cropping and rangeland systems, and that's primarily through um, their activities in the dung pack, uh, uh, suppress some uh, dung breeding pests. Uh, they're important in nutrient cycling, gas sequestration, and they can also improve the moisture holding capacity of the soil. Now, um, uh, manure is a, a very ephemeral resource. It doesn't last very long, and as a result, this group of insects has diversified greatly to make best use of this uh, short-term resource. And they've largely divided into these three groups, the dwellers uh, that live their life um, uh, within the dung pat, the tunnelers that 
uh, form these brood balls and they um, form them out of the pat and dig them down into the soil, uh, well into the root zone for plants to to reach those nutrients eventually. And the rollers um, that are a little more enigmatic, I guess you could say, uh, they carve a piece of dung ball out of the dung pat, uh, move it some distance away from the pat, and then bury it. And in the work that I've been doing with uh, Martha Mamo and others at the University of New Nebraska, we've been asking, uh, looking at these two hypotheses as to how um, at least uh, carbon and nitrogen cycles on rangeland um, might be influenced by dung beetles. And these are two general hypotheses that we're looking at, uh, asking whether or not the, the soil pool of these resources, the dung and excreta uh, in general from cattle, uh, whether they are linked to the plant pool or are they linked resources for the plants to take up or through these different grazing strategies, um, uh, continuous grazing or some of these other uh, grazing methodologies, might they separate these two uh, more than others? So uh, we've been looking at grazing strategies and how they influence these carbon and nitrogen cycles and what dung beetles might contribute to that. So the treatments we've been looking at for our dung beetle component of this has been um, looking at continuous grazing, uh, haying only treatment, uh, a mob or a high intensity grazing, a uh, rotational grazing strategy, a once over rotational grazing, twice over, and a no grazing strategy. And through our studies, through a couple years of studies, we found all three um, niches, uh, all three um, uh, groups of dung beetles, the rollers, tunnelers, and dwellers in all of these treatments in various abundances and diversities. And this figure shows uh, two years of our data showing the dung beetle diversity uh, over these grazing treatments. And on the y-axis, the 1 over D is just a metric to measure um, diversity of uh, a group of organisms, and as that increases, uh, so does diversity. Uh, insect diversity, in this case dung beetle diversity, is generally seen as a, a proxy for uh, a more robust system. So the higher the diversity, the more robust the system is said to be. And here you can see both in our 2014 study and our 2015 study, we had significantly higher dung beetle diversity in any treatment that had a rotational grazing strategy. So another key component you can see on this graph is that there was no statistically different treatment uh, effect between the three rotational treatments. And in our area in Nebraska, uh, particularly in northeast Nebraska, a twice over rotational grazing strategy is a common practice. So this says that our producers in that area may uh, have the best management strategy in place. Uh, at least from the perspective of dung beetle diversity. Now switching gears a little bit, well, uh, let me back up a second. There was some work that was done uh, throughout Finland uh, where they looked at exclusion of uh, some particularly important dung beetle uh, recycling groups uh, using some exclusion cages, uh, which is something that we had not looked at in our study. So we looked at diversity. Um, I didn't share any of the exclusion cage study from our from our work, but here in this figure, it's basically uh, showing some evidence that as you um, uh, exclude more and more of these dung uh, decomposers out of the system, uh, the less uh, biomass uh, from those PAT uh, can be taken out. And so that is said then to translate to uh, the more biomass that you uh, is removed in this study, the higher the um, uh, potential was for degrading those pats and presumably moving manure into the soil and entering it back into the nutrient cycle. So switching gears a little bit and talking about uh, some of the work that Gary Brewer, Dave Boxler, and Jerry Zhu have been doing, looking at incorporating some repellent insecticides that would be said to have a, a more mild interaction with, with dung beetles and other beneficial insects in manure impacted environments. So they've been focused on stable flies, um, which we'll learn a little bit more about today. Um, they affect cattle productivity as they take multiple blood meals per day, and their protruding mouth parts deliver very painful bites uh, to cattle, usually in the lower legs and ankles. And let's see here. Might be missing a slide. One second. <laughs> 
And so, um, let me back up here. So, uh, typical larval habitat for for these flies is pictured here. Um, they're not necessarily obligate manure breeders, uh, but some like uh, cattle fly pests, um, for example. Uh, but the manure associated larval development sites are a major production source for for stable flies, particularly in rangeland environments. And so, here you can see a large bale feeder. Uh, and the mixing of manure with a lot of the feedstuffs uh, present around these sites provides a good breeding site for uh, for these flies. And so they're an important pest of cattle. Um, an economic injury level for this particular insect would be said to be uh, five flies per leg or more. Uh, this picture of this cow present here uh, has uh, 20 stable flies or more per leg. And um, this has a large effect on cattle um, behavior, causing some defensive behaviors, um, actions, uh, as well as creating some, some irritation in the process as well. So some of the effects of these uh, flies, um, uh, uh, there's these bunching behaviors that can occur. Um, this can, uh, of course, if they're, they're bunched together, uh, particularly in pools of water, they're not feeding. Uh, and they can cause some overheating issues in cattle as well. Some of the typical treatments that um, that can be used uh, are these mist blower applications. Um, uh, this mist blower has some uh, advantages and that cattle uh, readily acclimate to it, um, to this tool, uh, and it's effective in reducing fly loads on pastured cattle. Disadvantage is that they require weekly reapplications uh, and the cost of equipment uh, is uh, is expensive for for startup. Um, and so this mist blower has been adopted for uh, by some producers in Nebraska um, and many feedlot uh, managers as well. There are relatively few insecticides that are registered for on cattle fly control, and flies are developing resistance to some of the more commonly um, some of the more commonly used uh, insecticides. So um, what Gary and others have been doing uh, has been looking at three years of study here so far. Uh, they had um, uh, dry lot treatments they had to use in 2013 and 2014 due to drought, uh, but in 2015 they were able to get these studies out on pasture. So they used they were looking at a multi-year study using geraniol, uh, which is a repellent biopesticide, to manage stable flies on Nebraska pastured cattle. So these were the treatments that they used. Um, the cattle were randomized into four treatment groups, and individual animals were treated weekly by moving them uh, through a holding chute and then released back into their treatment groups in a pen or pasture, uh, depending on the year, as I mentioned earlier. So here you can see the treatments. Uh, there was a control. Uh, they had the repellent alone, uh, an insecticide alone, permethrin in this case, and then they had what they call a push-pull treatment. So half the cattle were treated with repellent, uh, and half the cattle were treated with an insecticide. And in some ways, this is very similar to what is done for grasshoppers on rangeland. You treat um, uh, part of the group, in this case with a repellent, uh, should push the flies away from those cattle and then onto the cattle that have the insecticide treatment. So the thought here is that you would at least half, you would at least have your insecticide application costs uh, in the fourth treatment. So this first slide, I've got three of these, uh, shows the results, uh, in this case from 2013. So this was dry lot situations. Uh, on the y-axis are the number of stable flies um, per cow across weeks. So we had six weeks uh, where they uh, took measurements. And in 2013, you can see that there was uh, um, fairly high stable fly numbers. Uh, and over the course of the study, there's clearly a repellent effect uh, seen by both the insecticide and the push-pull treatment. Uh, you can see those having the lowest numbers here. And because the pens were relatively close in proximity, the flies were pretty uh, they're readily able to move from repellent treatment groups to animals without repellent treatment. Uh, so a good source of flies was, was no problem here. Looking at 2014, uh, that same uh, figure layout, um, again, pretty high fly numbers, 
uh, and it was also done in a dry lot situation. So in general, the fly populations were higher uh, in the control. Uh, a lot of the other treatment interactions kind of grouped together in this case. Um, and so, um, uh, so fly populations in all three groups of the treated cattle behave similarly uh, with populations per animal moving kind of up and down together throughout the season. In the last slide here for 2015, uh, it was very similar to 2014. Uh, in this case, uh, the 2015 group was taken out on the pasture. Uh, and we see uh, much lower stable fly levels uh, with the cattle being on pasture instead of a dry lot. Uh, nonetheless, you can see that the control, again, had the highest number of stable flies uh, compared to all of the treatments um, uh, compared to the control. If we look at 2015 and uh, pool, uh, uh, take a mean average per cattle throughout the season, throughout those six measurements, uh, again, you can see pretty clearly that the control was the highest over all the other treatments. Uh, and again, uh, with an economic injury level of four or higher, uh, we can see that uh, really all of the treatments had uh, fewer flies than, than what would be considered economically important uh, for cattle treatment. So this was pretty surprising uh, in that um, even the repellent in this case was as effective as uh, the insecticide uh, or the push-pull strategy. So to summarize that portion, uh, the, we saw that over the three years of that study, um, Gary and his collaborators saw a consistent uh, repellent activity, um, uh, reducing the fly numbers per animal compared to the control. Um, and in, in at least a couple of those years, um, the even the uh, repelling insecticide was equivalent to the insecticide treatments. So there could be some cost savings there um, uh, in just the repellent application itself. However, some novel chemistries would be needed uh, to really um, come up with the right formulation for that repellent uh, to be uh, effective. So uh, looking ahead, uh, we can make some general conclusions about, uh, about these um, both the uh, cattle management practices, we're looking at dung beetle effects and how that might fit into some of these uh, more bio-safe, if you will, uh, pesticide approaches uh, for manure management. Uh, uh, we've learned that a push-pull strategy can control stable flies, uh, and in fact, maybe just the repellent by itself may be effective. Um, we can assume that, um, and based on the data from our uh, diverse uh, dung beetle diversity studies, uh, we did see that um, uh, safe assumption is that reduced conventional control, um, or I should say from, uh, if, we, if we look at um, uh, the possibility of using some of these biosafe pesticides, it may be that uh, reduced conventional control uh, could in increase dung beetle uh, diversity. Uh, we know that uh, as we reduce continuous grazing, or rather if we move into a rotational grazing strategy, so we can see an increase in dung beetle diversity. So those two factors uh, may be compatible with one another and uh, perhaps play off each other in a beneficial way. And uh, an assumption we still have in place is that increased dung beetle diversity uh, results in increased nutrient and pest control services. Uh, this has been shown in, in several systems. Um, I don't think we've completely answered that for, for Nebraska and uh, for rangeland systems in general. Uh, but that's, that's looking ahead at where we'd like to go with this research in the future.